this is House Ways and Means, April 30th, and um, we are meeting on a couple of issues this morning, um, more discussion about the Education Fund, which is following on the discussion, the presentation we had yesterday from Tom Cavett and from Mark about uh, revenues and sort of the challenge in fiscal 21 in particular. Um, and then we are also going to spend some time on S344, which is a bill that came from the Senate. I don't think it's going to come in our committee at this stage. It, I, it's, I don't believe that it affects the education fund, um, but I thought the committee should have a review of it and an understanding of it. Um, we have, I have invited uh, a Sorsha just to let you know, I asked uh, Sarah Copeland Hansis if, if she wanted to join the meeting for that discussion or if she wanted to have someone from her committee. They're meeting at 1030. So she was going to send an email to you and to me if she was going to ask somebody to join and um, and then you could send that person an invite if, um, if that happens. So she may come on or somebody from government operations may come on. Um, so before we start, I want to give committee members a chance if anybody's got any announcements or questions or anything before we get rolling. I, don't, uh, I see Jim Maslin raising his hand, his actual hand. Uh -huh. um, I believe you all saw it because I, uh, I sent an email out within the last hour about um, request of municipalities to be able to move highway funds to the general funds within the town and vice versa um, so that they have flexible money for COVID responses. And I don't know which bill it goes on, but it may very well be something that we need to discuss with this community. So I'm, excuse me, committee. So I'm just um, letting you know a second time. Okay, great, thank you. So don't, I don't know where, I don't know where the discussion should happen. Right. So um, just remember to bring it up when it seems appropriate. Thanks. Um, I asked Ledge Council to draft an amendment and to suggest which bill that's moving maybe in GovOps or something that it may go to. Okay, right. And if, and if it turns out that that bill is the right vehicle and doesn't come in the committee, you can do it as a floor amendment. Sure. Thanks. Um, all right. Um, I don't see anyone else with a hand raised. Um, and just a reminder, if you can use the blue hand because I'm keeping the participant list up on the side and that's the easiest way for me to track it. And then I also know sort of what order people have uh, want to chime in. Um, oh, Pat, you're back. Good to see I you. I am. We lost you briefly, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, good. Uh, Robin, were you trying to get attention or no? Okay. Suggesting uh, Pat turn his turn his screen horizontally, and then we'll see. Who me? There we go. There you go. All right. Um, so, Mark, why don't you sort of start us off by um, reviewing again the one pager that we looked at yesterday? And um, we have, I guess, we have Doug Farnham here um, as well from Tax. The, the reason I asked Tax to come is if we decide we want to pursue something like this proposal, um, the, the two big questions are, one, is there money to fund it? And two, can the tax department do it? Um, we can't answer the question about whether there's money to fund it at the moment, um, but we can start looking at whether it can actually be implemented. So uh, tax is here to help us with that. Doesn't mean they endorse the concept or anything, but they would be the folks who would have to implement something. So Mark. I think you're muted. Mark, you're still muted. Yep. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. I was just I was wondering can you can you see the document on my screen? Yeah. Uh, I can. Okay. Else can. Okay. So this this is the sheet we went over yesterday. So I can just re review um, what was going on. The proposal would be intended to um, limit the education property tax increase that we're expecting next year through the use of the the, the federal um, money. It's not CARES Act money. It's the COVID. Uh, excuse me. That's okay. <laughs> uh, what's ringing here? Um, A lot going on. Yep. Um, 
So um, anyway, starting with one, the first thing we had to do is to figure out how much money do we need? Do we think we need an FY21? So there is basically $5 million, we think at this point that we will need to cover um, in the, uh, from FY2020. It's possible that we might get some additional revenues to come in and be able to balance the fund or at least not go into a deficit in 2020. But right now that's what we're carrying. Uh, we also need $38 million to fully restore the education fund stabilization reserve. Um, that amount grows a little bit every year. So that's up to 38 million. Um, there's about $74 million um, to fully fund the um, spending that voters have already approved for FY21. And then um, based on Tom Kovetz's um, first forecast for FY21 that he presented yesterday, we're expecting the non-property tax monies that come into the education fund to fall by about 113 million. So big hole next year. So what this proposal um, would do is um, it would create two education tax rates next year. The first one, which I labeled a normal education property tax rate on this sheet in item two, would be based on the education property tax rate parameters that the secretary uh, or the uh, tax department recommended in the December one letter. Um, and those rates, if you remember when we went over them earlier, would have increased the average homestead tax rate by almost five cents, the non-homestead tax rate by six cents, and then the average rate on household income by about 0.8%. Those should be familiar to both school boards and voters. Um, it's what we were working on right up until the time that the COVID-19 issue raised up. That brings in those changes alone raise taxes and bring in about another $80 million. So about $80 million of this gap that we've talked about in one would be covered by the normal education tax rates that we have in place. That still leaves a big hole. So the next step would be to determine the additional money that would be needed um, in, in FY20 and FY21 that would be uh, solely attributable to the revenue downgrade that's been created by the COVID outbreak. Um, in order to cover that money, we right now, um, it does not look like the federal um, CRF money is a, it's a permissible use for that because they explicitly prohibit um, using that money to replace lost revenues. But, um, you know, just this morning, I heard um, some conversations um, in DC about making more money available or making the money that we have available more flexible. So that's still an open question as to whether or not some of that federal money could be used to close this. But um, that sort of in a nutshell, that's, that's the idea behind the proposal, how the money would actually go out to taxpayers I haven't dealt with on here, but there's a number of different ways it could happen. Um, but um, so unless there's any questions, uh, that's about it. Um, I've got a a couple, but let me see if committee members um, have have questions at the moment. Um, so um, I've got a, a question, which is, why would we start um, on the normal rate with the commissioner's letter rather than the um, rates that we thought we needed based on school budgets, which were slightly lower? We could. I mean, th that's possible. I, 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 I use those because that was the, the, the last balance sheet that we were looking at in ways and means where we were using those parameters. So what changed was um, the spending estimates. Yeah. So that the average tax rates moved around a little bit because spending came in a little bit lower than was anticipated yeah. back in December. But otherwise I use these, but no, you could, you could use any rates on here. It just would, it depends on how much you would shift over to the COVID-19 rate versus the normal rate. So right okay. now we're looking at, with these rates, you look at a, the COVID rate would be about 17 cents. So if these rates were lowered or raised, it would affect that COVID-19 tax rate. It seems to me though that, that um, the spending is going up 73 point something million, I yep. think, close to yep. 74. And with the so-called normal tax rate, we're raising 80. Um, so yep. it, it just seems, um, I mean, I agree it's, it's, it's just a choice which category you put it in, but it seems more defensible to me to say that that normal rate would, 
cover what we know about spending, which would be closer to 74. Um, I don't know, any, anybody on the committee have any thoughts about that? Not, not that people are gonna find it easy to pay that normal rate, but, um, but uh, let's see, George and Emily. Yeah, I agree with you. I, I would like to start with the, the race we thought we needed based on the, you know, based on the spending that was approved rather than, <clears throat> rather than where we were back in December. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so order, order, yeah, go ahead, Mark. I was going to say, in order to do that, we'll have to go back and make pretend that the revenue downgrade did not happen and do it and build a balance sheet with the original January forecast in it. Is that what we're talking about? What I was thinking is that we would take the new spending, which is 73 to 74 million, and we right. would set the tax rates to raise that, ignoring ignoring all the revenue questions, just say, um, does that make any sense, Mark, or not? Um, well, I'm trying to think it through. It may, it may not because I'm, I'm just trying to figure out how, where, where we would set those rates. I mean, the, the, the property tax fills in whatever we don't cover with non-property tax revenues. So right. we have to have, I think we need to have something in there, even if it's a placeholder in order to do the calculation. Hi, Mark. Yeah, sure. Go ahead. <laughs> um, I just Representative Ansel, um, Chloe Wexler from JFO speaking. Um, just letting you know that we can rerun those yields. Um, they would there will be, you know, about four point. They'll raise about four point five million dollars less, um, but we can set the yields to do yeah. that. That that's sort of what I was thinking. I realize it's kind of arbitrary, but if we're telling taxpayers this is what you need to, this is what we expect you to. Um, pay the, um, it ought to connect to the actual budget somehow. So uh, I've got a list of people here. So Emily, uh, Emily, Robin, Jim, and Bill. I think that's it. Um, I think matching as closely as we can makes a lot of sense to me. So the 74. I'm okay. curious about, um, I want to try to better understand the mechanics of this, if that's possible at this point. Um, Let me go through the questions and then we'll get to the mechanics if, if that's okay. I don't know if people want to weigh in on the on where we start. Um, Robin? Yes, I agree that we should we should separate the um, what the actual voters voted for and what COVID-19 is costing us. Okay. Uh, Jim and Bill. Um, yeah, this may be summarizing these last couple of comments, but there's a couple of ways we could approach this. One is how do we present this to taxpayers? What's straightforward? Uh, and then the other one is um, what's the most logical way in this committee to get to the number? And um, logic, I would see, seems, I mean, we're gonna come up with a number anyway, but I, um, so we could approach this either way as, as we've been discussing, but it certainly would be nice if we could tell taxpayers something to the effect of this is the least scary of um, the burden we're putting on you. Uh, Bill. Uh, don't forget there are 19 districts with no budget. Yes, right. and you're one of them. I do, yeah. and we'll have a discussion about that. It continues to be a concern. It doesn't change the 73 million because they put those districts in on their proposed budget. So, and so yeah. that it, right. it wouldn't change the amount, but it certainly has an impact in those areas. Um, Scott, is this a, I need to go back to Emily on the mechanics, but um, do you have a question on the, or a comment on what we've been talking about? Uh, a comment, but it, but feel, by all means, uh, finish up with Emily if you need to. Well, no, she's gonna shift gears to how oh, this. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah um, I'm just, my I really don't care for this plan. I think that um, the existing system of, you know, whenever you dump money into it, you, you uh, increase the yield, you decrease the non-homestead rate. Um, this all, it's all the same. Um, and then at the end, you know, you make judgments, you make judgments to adjust the income yield or property yield or non-res rate. Um, I think we're almost here doing a ready shoot aim exercise. We don't, this is a proposal. We don't have any analysis. We don't know what's going on with the different deciles and income. 
some people are unaffected by this um, event. Some people are really making out really well on income. Other people are losing. And I, I just think that we have, a, we have a process in place. If you dump money in, it affects the yields, it affects the non-homestead, and then the legislature makes a judgment decision. I think the other thing you're really setting yourself up for by doing something like this is every district is going to have a really high rate. And then they're going to get the December 1 tax letter. And 22 is not going to look real good either. And districts are going to look at that different. They're going to say, well, you know, this was our rate last year and this was our tax rates. Um, and this, we want our tax rate to be the same this year, but you're not supporting us. And then that gets thrown back in on the legislature like it's our fault. And um, I just, I think we have a really good process in place for dealing with this. And I think we should use it. And I, do, I don't think we should, um, I don't think we should pursue this. Okay. Um, Emily. Um, I'm trying to understand the, the mechanics of sort of sending money out separate from like, what is, what do we even imagine this would look like on a tax bill for people to try to even understand this separate tax rate? Um, will people be able to comprehend it as a different thing? And then how soon or in advance would people receive separate money from, for this um, as we imagine it? And I don't know if the thinking on that has even gotten that far. I just worry about you know money coming in advance and then it going out in a different direction before people right. are able to pay their taxes or it comes so far after. You know, tax rebates really only help middle, like upper middle income folks usually. Um, so, uh, so we'll have, that's why we have the tax department here is yeah. to talk about that, but sort of based on the, on these comments, I think it'd be good if Mark walked through a little bit about what the concept is, um, because that may help understand. Um, but I, I, I think the initial concept was to send back a flat uh, payment to um, taxpayers based on parcel count, parcel counts. So if you owned a parcel, you would get this flat amount, whatever it is. And you could use that to offset this COVID-19 tax increase that you're facing. Um, when Act 60 first passed, we actually did send checks back to taxpayers to help them with their bills. So we found out that taxpayers didn't make a good connection between the check they received and the, and the bill. And in this environment, it might even be more confusing because people are receiving checks from the federal government and other things. So Another way to deal with it rather than sending a check would be to provide a credit the same way we do with the property tax adjustment now on the tax bill. Right. Or you could, we could remit the money to the town and the town could apply a credit to the bill. So there's a number of different ways I think you could do it. The tax department would be able to address this better since they would actually have to administer it. But um, I don't think we've got down way down to the weeds on this it was sort of conceptual still. But the, the other um, concept, which we've talked about some, but just to um, say, it, say it again, um, is that we would set the normal tax rate sort of along the lines of what we're talking about. That's what, um, that um, is what the base would be for, mm -hmm. to, for the 22 um, discussion. It would be the normal tax rate. And then we would have a separate COVID-19 tax rate and, um, one some in some way find money and find a method for applying a credit against that separate tax rate um, so that that would sit off to the side that that's the concept um, you know i'm i'm looking at this and i'm thinking taxpayers this year are not going to be able to afford to pay a 22 cent increase um, that i i don't see how that is going to happen so i'm trying to think about ways that we can help with that but um well the reason we're having the discussion is that there will be other good ideas and probably better ones in how to approach this. Scott, George, and Emily. Yeah, um, by doing a flat um, flat tax credit, um, effectively, some people will see a twenty-two cent increase or whatever it is because the um, the credit will be such a small proportion of their their bill. In fact, some people will get a really huge property tax decrease and others will get a really huge property tax increase by using a, a flat credit per parcel credit. Yeah, uh, George. If, I mean, before we argue about the, the final 
the way to actually get the money back. I, I mean, I think we should have the discussion to make sure everybody's on board with the, the concept. The concept being we set the normal tax rate, we use as our base um, where we were, um, not back in January, but, but when the school budgets were, that came in were in, and, and then we figure out a, a different mechanism um, which will take a lot of discussion, but a different mechanism to get the money, the additional money, which would be, you know, 22 cents or um, actually a little bit more, um, I think, um, if, because of where we're starting. Um, I, I get that, figure out a different way to do that. But I think that, um, I, I think first, I want to be clear if people are in agreement with doing the conceptual thing. Yeah. And, and we, we just really, you know, we've talked very generally about this. This is the first time we've really had a chance to weigh in on it. And I agree. Um, and I am very open to other better ideas if they're out there. Uh, Emily and Joey. Um, two things, one, are there, if we were looking at ways to sort of backfill school districts um, or the ed fund, we already know that the CARES Act money is has to go sideways to something somehow. We're not still, my understanding is we're still not sure exactly how we're allowed to make that flow somewhere. Um, so I'm interested in exploring if there is another possibility of adding some other fund to that as well so that we can backfill, but that's a much larger conversation about other, you know, other sources of revenue that um, I'm certainly happy to have and haven't had that with this committee yet, um, personally, and I'm sure you've all gone around the bend on that a thousand times over before. Um, and then, so I guess I'm not stuck on this proposal. Um, I do think it's important to explore other ways of backfilling. And then complete point of clarification question. When we talk about a parcel, what exactly does that mean? So I think that my like two and a half acres at my house is actually three separate parcels because of some bizarre thing that happened somewhere once. How does that, what is a parcel? <laughs> that's a good question. And um, it's good for the tax a, department. They, yeah, yeah. It's a detail we haven't gotten down into yet other than to try to um, identify districts that are tax exempt. So that's as far as we've got down into that. But you're right. I mean, even even a, your situation sounds unusual, but even apart from that, you know, people may have multiple parcels, and would, if it was a parcel payment, they would get multiple assistance. Joey. <clears throat> I'm not. So if this flat rate goes to everyone, it'll go to the top 1% of taxpayers and also the bottom lower income people taxpayers I mean it just why why in this time of would we be giving money to um, folks that don't need it if it's um, if if we did a flat credit you're right it would go to everybody regardless of income the the normal tax rate is income sensitized so that wouldn't change um, and a flat dollar amount is much more valuable, if you will, to somebody at a lower income level and with a lower um, property value. So the, if, you're, if your tax bill is $12,000, that flat amount could be a really tiny percentage of what you mm -hmm. normally pay. Uh, but if your tax bill is $600, it would be probably more than what you would normally do. Yep. So, um, so that, that's the thinking behind it. But the, the only reason to keep it flat is that the, the discussion that we haven't had yet with the tax department is whether this is even doable. Um, because if we're trying, you know, the, the, I'm starting with the premise that people are not gonna be able to pay 22 or 23 additional cents this year. I'm, I'm sort of, that's where I start. Um, if I'm, I, I think Scott is saying that they can. I, I think that's what I heard from him, but he's on my list here, so he can tell me I'm wrong. Um, but if if the committee feels that that is something um, that we need to do something to address, then what we what we need now are people's ideas on how to address okay. it. This is one, Scott. Scott, you're muted. 
sorry. No, okay. I'm not saying I'm not saying that they can pay that. I'm, what I'm saying is is that if you just if you dump the money in like we do every year, um, different amount obviously, and that supports the yields and that supports the non homestead rate, and you bring the rates down to where they would have been using that that <clears throat> method. Now, if you get to the end, and we do this every year, if you get to the end in the mathematical calculation, which spits out both yields and the non-homestead rate, if we want to look at that and say subjectively, we want to push and relieve a little bit of the burden wherever we want to push it or relieve it, we can do that. We do it every year. Um, and you know, once we have some analysis on exactly what the income deciles look like across the state, um, then we can make a, you know, a, a, a good decision if we want to change those yields or change that non-res or however we want to do it. I mean, our current process is perfectly capable of handling this situation. It does it every year, admittedly to a different magnitude, but I think to try to create a new system and which will in undoubtedly confuse districts and confuse taxpayers in the, in the interim, in the immediate, and then really confuse them when the December one tax letter comes out. I think that's a, I don't think we want to go there. Uh, Jim and then George. <clears throat> okay. Um, Scott, I think I agree with you. Um, with regards to the proposal idea concept Janet put forward, um, we've done stuff like that before, excuse me, I may have to sneeze, um, where we recognize, as Joey said, that if money goes out to everybody, um, it appears at first pass that the high income earners are getting a benefit that they shouldn't. Um, the fact that we have an income sensitized tax system, I think, on merit, um, on base, um, on um, all things considered, um, has a lot of merit and may turn out to be the best way to do it. Anyway, my 10 cents for this morning. Thanks. Yeah. George. Um, so I personally completely agree with the premise that we can't just add 22 cents to the property tax or whatever that number would be. Um, and um, I agree people cannot pay that. My sense is, although we haven't heard from everybody, that we can have agreement about that across the committee. Um, given that, to me, the next the next question is, what's the simplest way to do this? And if there were ways to just put the money into the Ed Fund as additional revenue, as Scott is, which is what I think Scott is talking about, uh, that would be, in my mind, the simplest way to do it. Uh, you know, whether it's borrowed money or whether we can direct some of the money um, from the, the, the feds directly into the education fund, um, that would be the simplest way in my mind to, to accomplish what we're trying to accomplish. I, I agree with that. If that's what Scott's saying, there's no question that just putting money in would be the, would be the, the sort of the most, um, uh, it'd be the easiest thing to do and it would be um it, it leave so the the reason for this idea is that we don't believe that we will have money that we can just put in um and so um if we can come up with i don't know whatever it is 200 million to turn in 50 million um to just add to the ed fund that'd be great i agree i i don't know if that's what you've been saying scott i not if it is i've i've misunderstood what you said um, no, I'm just saying, I think just, just use our current, just use our current, um, put it in, increase the yields, reduce the, um, the non-homestead. Like, you know, we do this every year at the end, right? We put in money and it helps out and typically, and this of course is a bigger magnitude, but um, I mean, in, in the end, if, if you give 200 million back, I don't know what the number is, 100 million back to taxpayers as a credit, or you put 100 million into the yield, it still reduces the burden on taxpayers by a hundred million dollars. 
So, so just to be clear, I agree with you completely. If, if what you're saying is the best thing to do is just put money into the Ed Fund. Everything that we've heard about the CRF and about any of the federal money would say that we won't be able to do that. So this is a workaround. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. The simple thing to do is just, um, just hopefully take federal money and put it in. I think it's more in the magnitude of about 200 million. It's a lot of money. Um, so- It's a ton of money. Um, yeah, so Jim, Mazin. You're mute, you need to unmute. Jim, you're muted. Yes, apologize. Um, uh, agreeing with these comments, um, Scott and Janet, um, but remembering what Mark Peralt said us about the complications on trying to get CARES money into the EDGE fund, um, if it's all that more difficult, I just soon avoid it. The one advantage or an advantage of the, the Janet proposal is that if taxpayers can see transparently money go from one thing to another through this credit idea, they at least know what we're doing and may understand and appreciate it. Yeah, Emily. I think you're muted. All right. What does it look like um, if the money goes, whether it's from the CARES Act or somewhere else, directly to the districts because it can't go into the Ed Fund. So we send it to the districts instead of individuals. How does that, the rest of everything get calculated from there? Mark? <laughs> um, I, I, I'm not sure I understand your question exactly. I mean, the, the yields would be calculated however you come about them as the normal amount. So if it was the normal amount based on December 1 or a normal amount that reflected where we were right before um, this thing hit, that, that would be a calculation. And then this, this additional part, the way it's conceived of now, it's just a flat, it's just a flat tax on everybody. And everybody would receive a flat check. And then you're right, it wouldn't match up necessarily to what they owe or how much their tax increased or decreased, but... Um, can I answer my question again? Sure. sure. Okay. Um, what if instead of a flat tax and this proposal, the money went, whether it's CARES Act money or some other money, um, went directly to districts instead of to households? And then we, I assume we would then have to send less money from the Ed Fund to districts. Um, How does that then get calculated? Like, do we... Well, you'd have to do it. So I, I'll jump in. You'd have to yeah. do that um, before you set the tax rate so that because um, they- Because less would be needed? And every, and every district um, it is going to get different amounts. To, I mean, I, don't, I guess there'd be an allocation question. How do you decide right. how much each district gets? And how, the impact on different taxpayers would be different because of the complexities of the way tax rates are set. Okay. Um, so there, there might, there might be equity issues. Um, I, I don't know. Um, it, anyway, George, do you want to take a stab at it? Are we going to jump in on that? You're still muted. <laughs> Mark, do you want to try it again? Um, I'm, I'm not sure what else to add at this point. I mean, it would, it, it would be, it would be a lot more complicated than what we're talking about here. I would just need to think through how it would work if the money went to the towns as opposed to the taxpayers. This, this proposal tries to avoid all those issues by putting money into the hands of taxpayers so that they can pay the bills. And that way we don't run into the kind of equity questions that the town would have and um, other issues about um, how that money would get out. Um, so I, 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 I need to think about it some more. I haven't, I'm, I'm not sure how to, how to address it. Fred may have some ideas. Scott, did you want yeah, to yeah, I think that um, by doing that, if you did that, that would be effective by reducing a district's um, by standard. giving by taking a sum of sum of money, dividing it out to the districts on a per an equalized pupil basis, and then reducing all districts by a, a fixed per percentage to replace that. 
that is effectively mathematically, I think, the same thing as dumping money into the yield. Um, the other thing I was going to say, if in, I, I think that I don't think we'll have to do this, but the um, if you actually did want to, it got to the point where you had no other option other than to give um, uh, parcel owners a um, a credit of sorts, uh, flat credit. Um, then really, I think the another the math would work out the same again as just dumping money into the end fund. But if you did a a flat percentage decrease of the property tax liability, that would work out the same. But it had to be a flat percentage, not a just a flat. Uh, George. Um, yeah, so um, the, when the feds with the CARES Act, the way the money was distributed to the districts was by Title I. Um, yeah. yeah. And so I wonder, Brad, if for Brad, if we know how that works out to the various districts at this point, is it anywhere close to our, you know, equalized pupil numbers or it, does it give us something that's really kind of skewed and, um, and, and not ideal? And my second question is probably for Chloe, but that is, have we calculated how much we are talking about here? Do you, want, do you want me to go ahead and answer? Please. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, at, at this moment, we've just gotten the application. We know how much we're going to, we have. It's just, it's a little over 31.1 million. What we don't know yet is how much is going out to districts. A minimum of 90% of that goes out to districts. Um, there is the provision that, that AOE is allowed to keep 10% of that 31 million total. I don't know if we're going to keep 10% 10 or not. That's that's a question for the secretary to decide. Once we know that, we'll be able to tell people how much they're going to get. Right right now, what I've told them is to give them a rough estimate. Figures probably somewhere around 80% of what they got in Title One this current year. That's you know give or take five percentage points. That's roughly about what they're going to get. Um, so. Is there, I, guess, is there, I guess I'll stop there for the moment, unless you have another question. Well, I guess, is, is there readily available the information about what they got on Title I, what individual districts got? With well, oh, that, 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 I knew there was another question I had that, that you just brought it to mind. Under, under our, our laws and an agreement with USED, um, our, our LEAs are not the school districts. They are the supervisory because of how small we are. Um, and so when, when you hear that money is come, being allocated out to, to, to by uh, Title I, it is actually going to the supervisor unions. They in turn have, will send it out to the school district. The language does not say that they have to send it out according to Title I from the supervisor union down to the school, down to the schools. Title I kind of ignores school districts. Um, so the, I'm not sure what the what the SUs will do. My guess is that they will probably portion it out in a, some equitable fashion to districts, but I don't think we've gotten to that point yet. So what is the AOE going to do um, with the, how is the AOE uh, uh, categorizing this money? Is this a federal grant that gets it, 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 it is a federal grant. It, it, it is a federal grant. They will have to do an application for it. We'll simplify it as much as possible. The uses for it are, are fairly open, um, but, but does it, it get netted it, against budgets in order to come up with a different ed spending figure for districts? It's it's kind of a I think it's a question of what it's going to be used for and when they're going to have that money when it's going to be used. Um, if it's used in FY twenty, it's going to offset some of the costs that some people are incurring right now. Mm -hmm. If other people would roll it forward, um, they have I think we have a year to, to to send the money out from the time the bill passed. So that's you know. We have to allocate the money out to the districts by March of um, 2021. Um, the districts then have to figure out how they're going to spend it. Hopefully, we'll get it out. They'll, they'll, they'll apply and get it sooner rather than later. But I think I think part of the question is which year are they going to get it in, and when are they going to plan on using it? My guess is most of them are thinking FY20, but but I have not been in conversation with them about that yet. I, I still don't. Um, maybe. maybe. Probably you I, I may have missed your and I didn't hear it, but um, I'm still trying to figure out whether this is federal grant money 
that changes the ed spending figure? It, it, it is federal grant money. It depends on how they use it, I think. Um, if, the, if they use it in FY21 to offset some of their other costs, that their regular costs that they can, that they can use for, then yes, it would reduce what, what they need. Um, but again, at this point, I'm not sure exactly what, what they're using it for, how they're intending to use it. George, did you get your question? Did well, you I guess what I'm trying to get at, is there any reason to think that when we get another federal aid package that they're going to suggest distribution to schools if, if they do it all um, any differently than by Title I? Or should we, should we be on this committee getting ourselves a lot more familiar with exactly how the Title I money gets distributed uh, to the various supervisory unions? I'll, 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 I'll send you that later today. Um, I'll jot down a note in a second. Um, as far as far as potentially new money coming out from the federal government, it's all it's all going to depend on what they say. That that initial coronavirus relief fund that, that the 1.2 billion five has had, had very stringent requirements on it. The CARES money is much more open and is going is being distributed differently. I'm not. I don't. There was another bill that came out. I forgot what it was, but I think that was for towns or maybe it was just for states. I'm not sure. They're talking about another one. I but at this point, I don't know to answer your question as to how that may come out and what it will be allocated on. Chloe, I see you have your hand up. Are you wanting to jump in? Um, hi, yes. Um, I was going to jump in earlier when we were, um, when Emily was discussing um, the option of sending money directly to the schools and, you know, if that would potentially be another way of putting money into the fund in FY21. Um, then we sort of went to Brad and he was discussing the federal money that's already available. Um, but I did want to indicate that. Um, I do believe that that would be a, a, a metric that could work um, if money was sent out in in a categorical grant, for example, to the schools. That would something that's something that could come out of their FY twenty one education spending. I think it could come out of their FY twenty one spending, but I think it would be too late in terms of what we're talking about here of the tax rate and has to be set. I agree FY21. completely. Yeah, I don't think it. Bill, did you want to jump in, Talbot? And that was that, that was my comment. Yeah. You have to get those numbers by June one, right? Yeah. So it's an offsetting revenue. They'd have to have it. No, it's an offsetting revenue by then. Right. right. To... They'd just be able to spend it, which is fine, but not what we're looking for. Right. Yeah. Uh, I don't see any hands at the moment. I want to welcome Rob LeClaire, who's joined us from Government Operations. Nice to have you. Um, and thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah. And I see, I didn't notice that Bill was here before. Um, 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 um. Other comments, George? Uh, while you're thinking, um, Chloe, I, I was asking earlier if, if we've calculated how much money we're talking about if instead of using the January um, tax letter, if we use where we stood with the Ed Fund and the proposed tax rates right before the COVID hit. Sure, so um, the December one yields are currently raising only about four and a half million dollars more um, than voted spending. So, um, and then the COVID tax, which is 17 cents is raising $149 million. So if we drop the yields a little bit for that four and a half million, the additional money that we would need to raise through an additional tax or, you know, any metric that um, you guys come up with would be 154 million based on, you know, the revenues that you heard about yesterday. Um, I'm going to just shift gears to uh, Doug Farnham to tax. Um, I know that you have had some conversations um, maybe with JFO about how this, something like this might work. Um, I guess the sort of general question is how would we get money back to taxpayers if we had money to get back to them? Um, and so have you, uh, can you share sort of your thoughts about it and maybe raise some questions for us and help us work through this? Of course, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, uh, Doug Farnham, Deputy Commissioner for the Tax Department. 
uh, thank you for having me. This has definitely been an interesting discussion. I think um, to do a, a big callback to Rep Kornheiser's question, a legal parcel is all contiguous land under the same ownership. So subdivision and zoning and all those other weird municipal things that can happen don't affect the legal parcel uh, status. So if say someone owns 10 apartment buildings that are in a row along the street, they that is all one legal parcel. Um, but Mark, it's correct that we have many more parcels in Vermont than we have owners. So if it's not contiguous, it'll be a separate parcel. Um, and we have about 340,000 owners. So mechanically speaking, uh, approaching this solution, I think that um, there's, there's a couple of things to keep in mind. The first is that the grand list fluctuates every year, 340,000 parcels. And we have somewhere in the nature of about 10 to 15,000 changes. Um, it, it, it varies each year depending on how many towns are reappraising, how many people are adding value to their property or dramatically losing value in their properties. And all of that fluctuation is managed and happens at the town level. So that the problem with the depart the tax department being involved in calculating a current year credit is that we don't have the accurate grand list data until after the fact. Towns don't send us their their grand lists until after they've already sent out started sending out bills. In many cases, they may send us abstracts and and working drafts, um, but they're constantly making changes to those grand lists on the town side, and it's it's kind of a a side effect of our current structure. So I think that any solution, well, any solution that we that would come up with involving the taxpayer would have to involve the the tax billing software that Nimric maintains. And it would have it would require development at the town level and kind of configuration at the town level. So it's not something that the, the state tax department could just unilaterally take care of. Um, it would have to, at a minimum, flow through the tax, the towns, and likely most of the or all of the effort would be at the town level. Um, so regardless of how that credit is calculated, and whether it's flat or whether it's a rate based, um, if it's a solution involving the the taxpayer's bill, it, we would have to pull in Nimric and figure out what it would take on their end, whether or not they'd have the capability to do it right now, um, and how much that would how much that would cost would be a secondary consideration. Of course, we'd, we'd figure that out after the appropriate solution was selected. Um, Doug, could I you interject for a second? When you said there are 10 or 15,000 changes each year, you're talking about the number of parcels? Or you're talking about ownership? I'm talking about, um, that's just a rough guess, honestly, of, of, the, of, of how, the many, how many are changing each year. Change um, ownership or changing that you have 10 or 15,000 new ones or fewer ones. Are you talking about the number of parcels or are you talking about who owns them? Right. So the number of parcels doesn't really change all that much. That's what I was wondering. Um, it, it's it's right around 340. It's that you were talking about the number and I, I, th I assume you're talking about ownership. I'm talking about ownership and value. So there's about yeah. 25,000 yeah. or so property transfer returns. Right. And we could get a line on those fairly easily. Um, but, uh, we're kind of behind the eight ball in that we haven't been adjusting the grand list for property transfers because it, it's not normally, um, you haven't had responsibility. Yeah. 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 Um, so I think that's the main thing is that, um, the department's data is, is behind, is a year behind. So if we were to calculate and send out a credit based on last year's uh, grand list data, similar to how the homestead and the property tax credit works, um, then you would have equity issues that would come up with that. We actually have complaints every year about the lag uh, in the property tax credit. So we'd be recreating those same issues if it were being done at the department. Um, so, so I think that data discrepancy and that need to involve NIMRC is, is the main thing I wanted to highlight is that um, if it's if it's a solution that would impact taxpayer bills, uh, having a conversation with them sooner rather than later would be the best approach, and that the relationship for the tax billing of property taxes is not between the state and and Nimric, but between the towns and Nimric. Um, we have a contract with them for the grand list software, but not for the billing portion. That billing portion is all a separate relationship. 
um, between the towns directly. But I do believe they're in every town at this point as far as tax billing. So at least you have a single vendor to, to deal with as far as updating the tax bill. Uh, questions? So I thought the uh, tax department sends a file to the towns with the um, tax information on it each, even though it may be based on last year's income. Um, Talis, for example, gets a file from the tax department that says I'm the owner and this is what my, if, if it's adjusted, this is what the adjustment is. You don't do that. Oh, ab absolutely, Madam Chair. So that is the homestead so why, file. Why wouldn't this so, be part of the file? Why wouldn't be because that's one hundred and seventy thousand, um, of which we only have about one hundred and fifty thousand or twenty thousand right now, I believe. Um, one hundred and seventy thousand total homestead declarations. So that covers half the grand list. Oh, right, it's not covering the non-homestead. So the non-homestead is where we'd primarily have the gap. Got it. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, any other questions anyone has? So you're telling us this can't be done? I, I'm not saying it can't be done, Madam Chair. Um, Do you recommend I'm, instead, you're gonna hear from all the property taxpayers who can't pay the 22, 23 cents. What's the, what's the, um, what's the administration recommending to us? So at this point, we don't have a recommendation because we feel that the uses of the federal money and the actual size of, of the revenue shortfall are still too unknown. So we do want to try to develop recommendations in May and June. Um, and and one, one thing is that, you know, options like this might have to be on the table at some point, but we simply don't know if we can use the money, the federal money in this manner at this point. And... Um, and actually how much of the shortfall is. The, the presentation from Mr. Cavett was very preliminary and kind of a, you know, kind of a rough cut size. So, um, but I do know that the administration definitely wants to pursue, um, you know, wants to discuss this and wants to pursue it. It's just that uh, we don't have enough information at the time to, to actually recommend anything. Um, oh. And I would say as far as mechanically, the tax department could be involved. Um, but it would have the downside of, of, you know, having between five and ten thousand and fifteen thousand errors. We may be able to figure out a way to compensate for some of those errors, but that would be a drawback of the approach. Is that um, we would have to figure out a way to clean our data, and um, and also the we'd have to look seriously at whether or not um, how quickly we could stand something like that up. If it, if we could stand it up in time for. Um, uh, sending it out in the regular credit file. Well, it does seem to me that the longer we postpone this discussion, the harder it is going to be to stand something up. George. So, uh, I mean, I don't mean to be argumentative, but the, the 2020, which is what we're talking uh, um, about right now, it, that was consensus data. That's consensus information. It's the 21 yeah. information that's uncertain. Um, but, um, you know, we're, we need to deal with, with both those things. So I guess my question is for this 2020, do you guys have any recommendations for us? Um, representative, I would, I would say that I'm, I'm perhaps not getting the question because 2020 tax billing has, has already largely been concluded. Um, and I know that there's been con some concern highlighted about potentially people not being able to make um, to pay their final bills in certain towns, but I don't know that that's actually come to light at this point. Um, so I I might not be aware of a major issue in 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 2020. Um, well, a, a couple things we're worried about whether that money is actually going to come in the, the the final payments, but we're also even if we assume it all comes in, we are still left in a negative balance in the education fund um, for 2020, even if we use all of our reserves and all that sort of thing. Right. Um, I think that's that I wasn't prepared to talk about that today. Um, I was uh, basically prepared to come in and talk about the mechanics of the property tax billing structure and how the idea you're talking about would work. Um, 
I haven't really taken a deeper dive on the balance sheet as far as uh, F fiscal year 20 education taxes. Uh, Karen, are you wanting to jump in on this subject? Thank you, uh, Karen Horn with the League of Cities and Towns. I do have one question. We had suggested at one point that you might freeze the grant list um, and in this COVID pandemic, use the grand list figures that um, we have already. It's, it does seem to avoid a number of issues. And I just wonder what you might think about that, the committee or Doug. Um, Doug, I don't have a thought about it because I don't know what it means. So um, anybody want to jump in? So I could jump in, Madam Chair, if that's okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so I would say that, that freezing the grand list, um, it would cut both ways on equity is, is the, main, the main pause to doing it, is that you could have people that hadn't built a house last year and have built, and built a house in the fall, mm -hmm. and then they wouldn't receive a tax bill for this year. So their neighbors would see them um, you know, not being on the grand list potentially. Um, or um, people that could have had a dramatic reduction in value from one year to the next um, wouldn't be on the grand list. So those changes in, um, in ownership and value that I talked about earlier, you would kind of solidify all of those, um, all of those issues. Now, uh, yes, it would, if you, if you then went in with the understanding that you're solidifying that grand list, you're freezing it, and you're accepting those equity issues up front, then we wouldn't have the downstream problems of applying the credit to the wrong person. But um, at the end of the day, if you freeze the grand list, but the ownership actually transferred from one year to the other, what do you do in that situation? I mean, the ownership transferred. Um, so I think there are, are logistical problems with freezing the grand list that when something has in reality changed about ownership, you have to recognize that you can't, you can't just send a bill to the old owner or send the tax credit to the old owner. Um, so, so, but it, there's some there, I think there would be things to talk through there. Um, I'm trying to understand what the benefit would be. Could you describe that for us, Karen? Uh, well, it, it seemed to us that the benefit would be that you wouldn't have all these issues around um, getting the grand list lodged. Um, the, 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 the whole lister calendar issues and you wouldn't have some of these issues that, um, that we talked about, uh, that Doug talked about with respect to um, the, the fluctuations at the town level and the town having to go through all the process of um, with NEMRIC of getting the most up-to-date figures. It, it just seemed like potentially given the scope of the work that needs to be done in the current situation, that it might be a, a simple fix, simpler fix. <laughs> There's nothing simple going on There's here. nothing simple. No. Um, let's see if anybody has any questions for Doug or for Karen. Uh, Mark. Yeah, well, Doug, here's- I just oh, You're co-host, so you have to wait. I know, that's why I, yeah, I can't raise my hand. Um, <laughs> Doug, would, would, would it be possible if there were, if it was, if a decision was made to provide a fixed, a flat amount per parcel for each taxpayer, wouldn't towns, couldn't towns just be directed to subtract that amount from everybody's bill before it goes out? It seems like there's space on the bill to do that now. We do it with the property tax adjustment. You would just be doing it for all taxpayers that the town's sending out bills to. Subtract $1,000 or subtract $500. That's what I was thinking, yeah. So I don't see how that would create a problem for the tax department or the, or the towns. Neither. So, right, I think that um, for most towns, especially since it, the the in the template, it would go in the state portion. Um, I think that there's room there. I think that it's highly likely that NIMRIC could do that work. Um, I just can't speak for their ability to do that work um, mm -hmm. because uh, if we were to do something at the tax department side, um, what we would do 
is say, say we went ahead with, okay, we know there's going to be imperfect data, but we're going to have the tax department um, add a credit to every parcel in Vermont. So that, that file instead of 120,000 property tax credits is going to be 340,000. Right. And it's going to be a full span list of every span that we have at the tax department. There's going to be some errors there, but we're going to work through it. Um, again, I'm just talking about how this would flow. We would send an education state payment at the town side, it would be blind to whether or not it was an income sensitivity payment or this, this COVID relief payment. Mm -hmm. It would be rolled into one. That's the only way you could avoid development at the town level. Right. Um, so you could avoid development at the town level, but you would be incurring probably a higher rate of error in the actual distribution of the payments. Um, so it'd be a, tra it'd be a trade off. It, it, and that's what I was trying to say earlier is that if the department were to drive the process, there would likely be more errors because our information is not as timely as the town. Um, but it is certainly possible. Okay. Any other questions for Doug? Uh, you, um, you are welcome to stay on. We're going to have a discussion of S344. I don't know if that's a, a bill that's of interest to the tax department. I assume it might be. Um, and um, I also just want to um, sort of uh, focus on the time that we have to figure something out here, um, which is uh, we're running, running short and, and we understand that we've got um, imperfect data uh, about revenue and about um, sort of the problem that we're confronting. But I really hope that the administration will um, work with us to try to figure something out that we can uh, develop to ensure that we have enough money to pay for our schools without um, impoverishing taxpayers. Peter. Um, would it simplify the discussion if we uh, focused on um, rendering aid um, at least initially and focus on the group who have filed and are homestead filers, uh, because it seems like it gets more complicated if you try to divide the aid uh, between the homestead and the non-homestead folks. I understand that there's a bit of an inequity there, uh, but my first sympathy goes, of course, to people who choose to file income taxes and a homestead declaration in Vermont. Uh, Emily, and and I'm, 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 we've got this other bill, so I'm going to move on, I think, after this question. Did you have a question, Emily? Um, I just wanted to respond to what Peter said, and that I appreciate the idea of focusing, focusing the conversation more. I think that's really helpful, but whenever we talk about just homestead folks, I really worry about renters and how they um, make out in any conversation and how costs are passed on to them. Well, I worry about businesses that have been shuttered for the last few well. months. Um, I, I, this is not one of these situations where um, you've got non-residents who are, are um, managing okay. Uh, anything else anybody's got? Tough conversation. So we're gonna keep at it. Um, and uh, Doug, just so you know, I think we'll do more of this next week and we'd like to have the administration participate if we can. So I don't know yes, if Madam Chair. for somebody else, but, um, but we'll hope, hope that you'll join us. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna, uh, I'm not gonna take a break. Normally we would, but it's, I'm gonna just move on and go to uh, S344. And I think Tucker Anderson is with us to walk through the bill. Um, as I said, this has gone to House Government Operations Committee um, and uh, we have Rob LeClaire, I think is still with us. I don't see him. Otherwise. Janet, he's, he's not, but I emailed him oh. that we were moving on to three for okay. now. Okay. Oh, okay, good. Maybe he'll rejoin us. Um, so Tucker, uh, could, I think um, hopefully we've got the bill. I know we have the bill because we have Sorsha, so she's bound to have given us the bill. The bill's here. Maybe we can do screen sharing and you could walk us through the bill and kind of help us understand what's in here. Um, and Abby's here too if we have questions relating to the 
education tax. So go ahead. Excellent. So uh, I will start and get right into it in uh, section one here of the bill. Uh, we'll start in subsection A. Uh, important thing to note about the uh, bill overall, and in particular here in subsection A, is that this is a temporary provision and that the authority that's being granted under this bill must be author uh, utilized um, during the state of emergency due to COVID-19. So again, the select board must use this authority during a state of emergency due to COVID-19. It does not extend through the calendar year. Uh, another important thing to note is the clause at the end here, the legislative body of the municipality is the body that is going to be using this authority. Uh, and we'll get to how that authority is exercised in subsection B. Uh, subdivisions one through three contain the uh, operative powers here. The legislative body is going to be using. Subdivision one, the legislative body is granted authority to extend or establish a new time and method of payment for the municipal property tax and the statewide education property tax that is collected by the municipality from the taxpayers. This authority exists. Uh -huh. Can I interrupt? What does method of payment mean here? Uh, in the underlying statutes, that would be uh, the municipality staggering payment dates throughout the year. So it's not whether I pay by credit card or check or okay. money. It's, um, it, it, it's just a, it's a funny term to me in here. I believe that these terms are often bundled because the taxpayer is not always the one who is supplying the funds to the uh, municipality directly. Uh, recall that many taxpayers are bundling their municipal tax payments with their mortgage payments, and the lender is often acting as the intermediary. Um, that may be another reason that method is incorporated here. Um, these terms are used in uh, an underlying statute that allows municipalities to change the time and method of payment at a townwide vote. So what subdivision one is doing here is it is shifting that authority from a townwide vote to the legislative body. Okay. In subdivision two, the legislative body is authorized to establish a grace period uh, for penalties, interest, or fees imposed on taxpayers. They're also authorized to decrease or waive any of those penalties, interest, or fees imposed on taxpayers for the late payment of municipal property taxes or the statewide education property tax collected by the municipality. Uh, this authority also exists in uh, underlying law. However, it is another authority that must be exercised by the town at a townwide vote. Um, otherwise, the fees that are imposed for delinquent tax payment are by default an 8% fee that is applied by the treasurer or delinquent uh, tax collector in the town. And in many cases, it is those fees that are used to pay uh, those municipal officers for their duties. Subdivision three allows the uh, select board to reduce the municipal property tax rate. Uh, you'll notice that this is the only subdivision here that does not mention the statewide education property tax. Um, of course, the select board is granted authority exclusively to adjust the municipal property tax rate. Subsection B uh, clarifies that the acts that were previously discussed in subsection A may be adopted by a majority vote of the legislative body. And then this is the most important piece here at the end. Each of these acts, if they are adopted, shall expire on January 1st, 2021. There was a lot of discussion about what the duration of these decisions should be, whether they should apply to fiscal years or a definitive timeline. Ultimately, because of the variety of fiscal years that political subdivisions, specifically municipalities, operate on, 
uh, the Senate Government Operations Committee determined that it was better to apply a definitive timeline for calendar year 2020 rather than having it apply to fiscal year 2021, uh, which has differing start dates. But in general, municipal fiscal years start either on January 1st or July 1st. On balance, most municipalities use a July 1st start to their municipal fiscal year. Subsection C uh, provides some reassurance here. It states expressly that this section, this bill and all of its operative provisions shall apply exclusively to the property taxes collected by a municipality from the taxpayers. It states again that this section shall not apply to deadlines, penalties or interest imposed on a municipality with respect to pay payment of the statewide education property tax that is due to a state or a school district. This is important because the municipalities, if the legislative body does, for example, uh, extend a deadline, waive any associated penalties or fees or adjust their tax rate, is still going to be obligated for their payments to uh, the school district or the state and the state's 8% penalty on those later deficient payments will still be applied to the municipality. So they will remain on the hook. And that's everything that I have for you. Thank you, uh, very clear. Uh, anybody have any questions? No? Emily, Bill, Peter, okay, Emily. Um, thanks, Tucker. If a municipality has not yet set a tax rate because it was not able to have a town meeting, is their only option under this to lower their tax rate and not set a tax rate? I'm not sure whether there are any municipalities that haven't had their annual town meeting yet. There is one, it's Brattleboro. Brattleboro. Oh, right. The representative town meeting. You are in Our a special, special thing. Yes. You are in a different situation there. The whole rest um, of the state. Uh, any of the um, power that the voters would have used at the representative town meeting would now shift to the legislative body for a town that has not had their town meeting. So here, all of these powers would still exist. They could extend the deadlines. They could adjust the property tax rate. Um, I'm assuming that that subdivision A3 would allow a town that has not set their tax rate for the upcoming fiscal year yet to do so. Even if it was going up? Yes. The Great. term Thank that you. is used is adjust. OK, thanks. Uh, Bill, and then Peter. Reduce. I thought it said reduce. No. It does say reduce. Not adjust. Yes. So they would only be able to reduce the municipal tax rate. It's a good so point. If that language changed to adjust, what else would happen? <laughs> they could adjust well, rather than reduce. I think it'd be quite something to say to legislative bodies throughout the state that they can increase the tax rate after the voters have said it. That's what I was thinking. I don't think that'd be a good idea. Um, Peter. Uh, I think Bill was ahead. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Bill. So Tucker, section two or subset two here. That requires a townwide vote, section one as well, subset one. I had some trouble hearing you. Can you repeat your question? Yep. I'm, we're having, I'm having trouble hearing you too. Um, I, everyone else I hear. So um, anyway, go ahead, Bill. <laughs> Sorry. So I heard you say that subsection two uh, requires a townwide vote. Is that the same for section one? Un in an underlying law, uh, all of these subdivisions would require a townwide vote here no townwide vote is necessary. The temporary power that would be exercised, exercised by the legislative body, no townwide vote would be necessary. Thank you. Yeah, um, Peter. 
my understanding uh, in respect to the authority that's presently available to the Board of Abatement in respect to water and sewer fees is that uh, no forgiveness or waiving can occur prospectively. And the word in your draft in section two is imposed. So in other words, the penalties and interest have to already have been applied and then forgiven retrospectively. Do I understand that correctly? I'm not sure that that was the intent of this language. Um, subdivision two, at least in the way that this was discussed, uh, was intended to allow the municipality to uh, waive any fees that may be applied to currently delinquent taxpayers or to adopt new fee rates, interest rates, or penalties that would be associated with future delinquency. Um, if that's a change that has to be made for clarity, I'll review if that's a policy decision that the committee makes, that this should either only apply retrospectively or that the language should be changed to clarify that this is both current delinquency and future. Uh, it, it makes it easier at the town level if it can be prospective. I was focused on the past tense of the word impose. You have an ED there, imposed. And, and consequently, because I'm familiar with the way the abatement works um, with water and sewer, that can only be forgiven or waived if it's already been imposed. Doctor, I have a question about the timing on this. Um, the, the, uh, um, so if a, if a um, town wanted to, under the current law, is it possible for the voters of a town for fiscal 20 to um, change the time and method of payment? I don't believe so. I think that the way that the uh, underlying section operates is that this is for future payments. So uh, for this year, and I welcome Abby to jump in if I'm explaining this incorrectly, but for the annual meeting in year 2020, they would be voting on these issues for fiscal year 2021. So they would be establishing prospective due dates and methods of payment for the upcoming fiscal year. Um, so, uh, but, so then help me understand the bill. Does the bill say that the legislative body can make those adjustments, you know, establishing a new time and method of payment for fiscal 20? And isn't that different from what the voters could do? This would be for calendar year 2020. And uh, it's my well, understanding- but calendar year 2020 includes fiscal 20 and 21. So yes. I'm asking specifically about fiscal 20. The yeah. argument that I've heard for this, and I'm, I'm not opposed to the bill, but the argument I keep hearing is we're just letting the legislative body do what the voters could already do. But I don't think I don't think the voters can do what this allows the legislative body to do. Uh, I'll ask Abby. Do you know whether there are still any FY twenty payments that have not been? Well, there are, there are plenty of payments. I'm talking about whether the voters mm -hmm. could could make a decision under current law to change the time and method of payment for fiscal 20. I so I can, so. Uh, yeah, Abby, go ahead. Yeah, so, sorry, my, <laughs> my cat has cho chosen this moment to join us. Um, so I think it would depend on when the town's um, next installment, installment payment would be due. But I'm, I'm trying to understand if it's, your question is about extending penalties and interest now, my question sure is, is very specific. I'm just looking at this bill and the, and the explanation of the bill that I've heard is that all we're doing here is we're allowing the legislative body to do what the voters can already do. And so I'm saying, what is it that voters can already do can already do for fiscal 20? Um, and I think 
I think they can't do anything for fiscal 20. I don't think they can make changes in penalties, interest fees, times and methods of payment. I think, I think they made those decisions already last year. So I think we're giving the legislative body authority that the voters don't have. That may be fine, um, but I just, I, don't, I, I, think it's, I think it's new power that the, vote, that the voters can't exercise now. So in, in the drafting of this bill, um, the different penalties and interests that were discussed were primarily the delinquent um, 8% that towns are I allowed. To focus on the fiscal year, not the mm -hmm. content of what they're changing. It's just what fiscal year this applies to. Right. I I, I, that's why the timing question comes up is, are there any installment payments left, which if a taxpayer missed them, these penalties would apply to that missed deficient payment. The, so the, I think that depends on a town by town. There clearly are, but does anybody understand what I'm asking? Mark, you usually understand what I'm asking. You wanna try it? I, yeah, I, I think so. I think your question is, could, could a town that still has an installment due, because some of them are still coming, and I think yeah. Chloe has a list of towns that still have payments due, could that, could that, could the, would this bill give the town the authority to make changes to those last payments at this late date? And, and Mark, if, if yeah. without the bill, could the voters make those changes? Karen, are you wanting to jump in? I, I thank you. I do think that the um, generally speaking, there's a time frame after a vote is taken within which you could petition, you know, for a revote on something like this. But I also think that you could have call a special meeting. Mm -hmm. I mean, under ordinary circumstances, you could call a special town meeting and um, change those delink, you know, those penalties and interest. Under current law. I, I do think so. I'm not a lawyer, but I know that um, towns do call special meetings for all sorts of issues during the course of the year. Mm -hmm. A special a full getting everybody, I mean, yeah, like, the problem is that we can't do that, but. Um, right, right, that is the problem. Yeah. So can I? I mean, I'm not saying I object to this. I just don't, I, I think the power that we're giving the legislative body is different than what the voters currently have. That, that's all, um, it, it may be fine. Um, uh, Tucker. I dropped the underlying statute into the chat for you all. Oh, you did. You'll notice yeah. that the language has similar ambiguity to what you are looking at now. And it does allow the town at a special meeting mm -hmm. uh, to vote to establish a new time and method of delivery uh, for the tax payments. And reading the language, I would assume that that would allow them to call a special meeting during the current fiscal year to push those installment payments to different dates. Um, however, being prudent and reserved here, I will say that I still do not know. Yeah. So what's the difference between method of delivery and method of payment? <clears throat> a lot of questions that I do not know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anybody else have any questions about this? Um, Karen, is this something that the league endorses? Thank you. This is a bill that we asked for. Yep. We have um, a number of towns that are looking at waiving penalties and interest right now. Um, and also we have a number of towns that are extending their due dates that want to extend their due dates. The one, um, the, the one distinction that the Senate Finance Committee in particular wanted us to make exceedingly clear to local officials is that this does not affect their payments to the education fund or the school district. Um, and from all our conversations with local officials, and we've had a lot recently, um, that understanding is very clear. Yeah, yeah. And I listened in on one of their meetings as well, and it was pretty clear that that was a concern. And it would have been a concern for us if they hadn't included the language, I think. Right, uh, right. 
Yeah. Do you want to jump in, Rob? Um, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I I do I think I do understand your question, and it it, it does seem to make some sense. It would seem to me that uh, the voters, unless they had a special election, really wouldn't have that authority right now. Um, and by doing what we're doing, it, it does get us to giving that legislative yeah. body the authority, um, but without a special election. Yeah. So I do, it, your question is a good yeah. one. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it, it doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the bill, but I just think that, that it, it's, we are, we are changing something um, fundamental in terms of the timing. Um, th thank you. I have another timing question. What does it mean to change, um, the dates, uh, I'm just going back, the, the time of payment of a municipal property tax and the statewide education tax. So let's say the legislative body says that we're gonna have three installments and we're gonna have uh, one this fall and one in January and one in May. Um, and then midway, then I think that what the bill does is it says that whatever thing, whatever you did under this bill um, disappears in January. What, what is that? What is that going to mean functionally? It's going to mean that any of those dates that fell after the Jan the December thirty first, twenty twenty, at midnight drop dead date disappear. So, so what uh, the legislative body will only have authority to set those new times within the current calendar year. If they were to set any that would be due. Uh, after January 1st, 2021, uh, their authority will magically disappear under the wand of the legislature and those dates will no longer be valid. And what does it go back to then? Whatever was uh, voted by the municipality um, at the most recent town meeting. So if that was a November payment for 100% and then they made three equal payments two of them in January, what, what happened? I guess that town just can't do it, right? Because they can't take a chance on it disappearing. This well, was a question that did come up in yeah. Senate GovOps about um, how this was going to break out for towns if they were going to push payments or already had payments that were due in calendar year 2021. And the response that I heard was that the towns would be able to appropriately organize and manage their calendar of payments within the current year. Yep. Um, uh, Mark. Um, I, I had a sort of a related question. I, I really, I don't know the answer to this, so I'm just throwing it out. But um, when, when I read the law, it says that municipalities have normally have 20 days after they collect the education property tax revenue to send that money to the school district. So 20 days. So if, it, if you're giving these, the, the towns the authority to delay these dates and push them back, is it also going to be pushing back the date that the school district can expect to receive those payments? And if so, aren't you just moving the, the problem from one entity to another? In other words, the school districts would then have to go out and cover that period of time in which they're, they, they would have expected to get a payment from their town and now they're not gonna get it because the town's decided to delay payments until June 30th or something. Um, does, does that make sense or no? Anybody, Brad, do you wanna jump in? You don't look like you do. I, well, <laughs> well, I do. I mean, it, <laughs> yeah, I mean it, it, it makes sense to me. I understand exactly what you're saying, Mark. Um, and again, it's, it's as I've said, if, if it, it, it sounds like under this scenario, either, either one entity is going to have to borrow or the other, either the town municipality borrows or the school district borrows in this case, if, if the money comes in late. So in terms of the taxpayer, it's, it's which pocket are you gonna pay a little bit more out of later down the, down the road in terms of interest if there's borrowing occurred. Um, I, I don't know if there's, I think it's gonna vary from town to town to town is the answer. <laughs> other questions, uh, Peter? Um, I <clears throat> have uh, had a conversation with uh, Carol Dawes, our uh, clerk treasurer, who also is uh, an official in the statewide organization, and they favor this. I just want to be clear uh, from, I guess, Tucker or Abby, um, our community, uh, many of the parameters that Janet identified that the voters could or would change at town meeting 
are fixed in our charter. And I hope it's the intent and my understanding that this um, statute would also uh, suspend or short circuit uh, any articles offended by that statute that are in the charter. But I want reassurance of that. Thank you. Yes, Representative Anthony. Uh, one of the things that we looked at when we were putting this together is that there are uh, many charters, particularly for the larger municipalities, that not only have uh, provisions that are specific to delinquent tax uh, fees, penalties, and payment, but also to fiscal years and due dates. Uh, so instead of calling out uh, the Title 32 statutes that are relevant to this, the opening salvo in uh, subsection A states, notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary. So this is going to notwithstand all of those very specific charter provisions. Uh, other questions? Anyone has? Okay. Any other comment, Mark? Did you have anything you wanted to weigh in on? No? Okay. Great. Thank you. Um, as I said, we don't. Oh, Jim has a question. Sorry. Yeah. Um, thank you. This. Um, the more questions that are asked, the more complicated this seems to get. And so it is, you know, um, I, it, I believe you said earlier, Janet, it would be nice to have a suggestion or guidance or, you know, work with the administration. At this point, um, if anyone I has- I think that was on the other bill, but anyway. <laughs> okay, I'm extending it. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, any suggestions on the most practical way to cut through this um, would be welcome, I think. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, it was question. the other bill, but- Question for Karen. Um, the um, we'd had conversation in the committee. I don't know if this is the appropriate place for the discussion, but we did have conversation in the committee about um, having uh, with the state treasurer, and I think you were present for the meeting about um, having the state help with um, interest rates if the if towns were required to do short term borrowing in order to make their ed fund payments. Um, and I, I don't know whether the league has a position on that. Um, and if you do what it is, um, and whether that's something that you would like to have the committee continue to pursue or sort of what the thinking is about it. I realize I didn't tell you that that's what we were gonna talk about today, but since we're talking about municipal uh, taxes and Great. education fund taxes. Thank you. Are. Yeah, we, we have had um, conversations with the state treasurer and I was in the meeting um, yeah. listening when, when Beth Pierce was in there. Um, it would be very helpful to have the state um, help with the interest costs on, on short-term borrowing or what might actually end up being medium-term borrowing. I don't know what short-term is like. <laughs> Um, given the current circumstances, but um, we did talk about the fact that it would be far preferable for a town to um, do the borrowing and get help with that interest versus paying the 8% penalty right. yeah. to the state or the, or whomever. So yeah, it's, we don't have, so what that looks like, it right. is not entirely clear yet. Yeah. So but I know Abby, um, I'm just gonna bring Abby into this discussion. I know Abby has been in touch with the treasurer's office. I don't know whether there's, I haven't seen it, but whether there's a draft that, um, that Abby has that the league has seen or sort of where we are in terms of, of trying to um, provide that support to towns. Do you have something? Uh, Jeff, I've not seen any draft. Okay. You have an idea. I, I have not received it. Becky Wasserman has been working with the treasurer's office and my, okay. um, what I've heard most yeah. recently is she's still waiting for the language. Um, I can check with her and get that to you when yeah. she's received a proposal. It'd be really, really helpful. You know, the banks were pretty clear that they had money that they wanted to be helpful. Um, and it would, this is, this seems like a vehicle for um, that kind of, 
idea if we wait till um, late May or early June. Um, I think that just leaves towns in greater uncertainty, um, late May, early June being when I'm hoping we finish with the, um, the uh, whatever we're gonna do on the education fund. I would rather put it in here if we, if we can come up with something. So um, I can, I'll give the treasurer a call as well, but I, I'd like to, um, if you all would continue to pursue it, if, if that's something that the league would find useful. And I, I'm guessing, Karen, it would be good if people knew that there was gonna be some action on it um, sooner than later. Well, well, that would be that would give people a lot of. Fur, yeah. But are you um, are you thinking about putting it into this bill? As well, that, it it occurs to me that it might go in there. Um, I didn't. It, it's a possibility. We don't have possession of the bill, but um, but we could probably do something. Yeah, I I would just be a little bit concerned about um, whether the other chamber okay. might. Um, get okay. upset about, I don't know, upset's not the right word, but worried. Yeah, okay, that's fine. Uh, there's no, we don't need to make a decision about it. I'd, I'd like to get that language um, in front of the committee though sooner than later and try to take some action on it. Uh, Peter. I, I would think if the uh, issue is for the towns to be able to borrow at the most favorable rate, uh, simply a letter from the treasurer backing or using or lending or supporting any uh, town uh, short-term borrowing with the full faith and credit would guarantee the rate. Then it's a question of whether uh, we would want to recommend essentially sharing the costs, that is to say the state of treasury, as opposed to the local FISC um, picking up a certain share that we would specify. Thank you. Well, when we heard from the treasurer, she indicated that we did need legislation, that she's not in favor of picking up the borrowing, but she is supportive of, of helping with the interest rate. So I'm just going with that discussion. Uh, anybody else have anything? We've actually covered a fair amount of ground. Are people generally okay with the bill, the way they've seen it presented? Um, head nodding, I don't know. Um, getting head nodding. Okay. Um, and I, I can understand, Karen, if people are concerned about it slowing down. So I'm, you know, I, I think the way it's come over to us, the worry that we've had about the education fund is um, basically dealt with. Um, um, uh, so, uh, which I appreciate. Anything else anyone has? Uh, Tucker, go ahead. Sorry, I had to move rooms because someone's operating a chainsaw directly outside of my window. But, <laughs> you um, should come to my house. I've got lots of things I need to have chains on. It's a little more strange in downtown Burlington, but I think they're trimming some hedges. Oh. <laughs> um, uh, may I ask for the committee members to uh, stay after committee is over to discuss a non- committee issue that involves all of the committee members. It's a, an opportunity for me to provide some legal counsel, hopefully after uh, the committee is done with its work today. Um, I, I'm, I, this is the first I've heard about this and we don't generally meet without okay. it being open. So um, I, I, um, I don't know what you're. I don't know what you're referring to. You want to send me a note or something? Sure, I'll send it to. Uh, <laughs> that would be helpful. I don't. I don't want to discuss legislative business after we've finished our meeting. So, is this an open discussion? No. Send no, me. It is also non-legislative. Non-legislative. Okay. Yes. Send me a note, and then okay. um, I'm sure I'm going to think it's great. Okay. <laughs> um, anything else? Anybody has? Here, um, okay. So um, committee, obviously on the Ed Fund, we have a lot of work to do um, and we're doing it with a very little information, but that's the hand we're dealt. And so 
Um, we will meet next week. I'm not sure exactly what times we're gonna have allocated to us. I've asked um, Catherine if we might be allowed to set our own schedule because um, Sorsha is available to help us. She's gonna get back to me <coughs> about that. But for the moment, I'm bound by whatever they, times they give me. So do plan on time next week and be thinking about better ideas. Um, so, okay. <coughs> Pardon me, um, I'm waiting for my message here. <coughs> Any other, um, Robin, go ahead. Yes, just quickly, are we expecting, <coughs> sorry. Oh, oh, <laughs> um, sorry. I wonder if, we're, are we expecting any other bills to be coming into our committee in the near future at this point, or is we really gonna be focusing on the ed funding? <coughs> I think we're gonna be focusing on ed funding. I'm, okay. I'm not aware of any that are coming in. Okay. Um, the bill that we just went over, if if we were in the building, probably would come in the committee. Yeah. But given how cumbersome all that is, I don't think we need to take it in. So I'm, unless somebody wants it in the committee, I'm not going to ask for it. Okay. Um, so it, is it in GovOps now, or is it going to go to GovOps? It, they... It's in GovOps. It got okay. Approved yesterday. Okay. Um, so. Um, okay. Thank you. 